Yes, yeah, she ran down the hallway. Ethan picked them up, shed his coat, hung it up, and put Zoe's gloves and hat on the table near the front door, where they belonged. By the time he made it into the kitchen, Zoe was sitting at the table with a cup of hot chocolate in her hand and a wide grin on her cherry-tinged face. And then Riley gave us tickets to her concert, didn't she, Daddy? Ethan knew Zoe would give his parents a rapid-fire summary of her meeting with Riley. She sure did. Ethan's mother raised a brow. Is that right? Well, isn't that nice? It sure is, Zoe said. And we get to go behind the stage and see her dressing room and hang out there the whole show, don't we, Daddy? Uh-huh. He got a sympathetic look from his dad on that one. Hey, Muffin, how about you come down in the basement with me and help me work on Grandma's dryer? You can hand me the tools. Okay, Papa. Zoe scooted off the stool and followed Ethan's dad down into the basement, leaving him alone with his mom, who poured herself a cup of coffee and took a seat at the kitchen table. Why in the world would you take Zoe to meet Riley? He shrugged. She wanted to go. And you obviously haven't learned to say no to that child yet. I say no on some things. Like when she wanted to dart out in the middle of the street into oncoming traffic or play with razor blades. Spoiling her isn't going to bring her mother back, Ethan. She needs boundaries. She needs to know that you care enough about her to give her limits. She's not exactly a brat, Mom. She's a great kid. That she is. But giving her everything in the world still isn't going to bring Amanda back from the dead. And speaking of that, does Riley know? About Amanda? No. We barely spoke a word to each other before the mayor dragged her away. His mother humphed, then rose and put her cup in the sink so she could resume stirring whatever smelled really good in the pot on the stove. Not surprising that Shims would want to get his face in front of the camera. Better him than you and Zoe, anyway. Are you going to take her to the concert? I guess. Zoe does love her music. His mother stirred, and stirred mentally, too. Ethan could tell because she went quiet like she always did when she was thinking. What? She half turned. Huh? What are you thinking? I'm wondering what all this means. What, what means? Riley coming back to town. His mother always had a point. Ethan just had no idea what it was yet. She's here to film some stuff about a biography. She'll be gone soon. Uh-huh. Everything happens for a reason, Ethan. Her being here means nothing, Mom. He rose and rinsed his cup. I gotta get to work. I'll be by to pick up Zoe later. Okay. Be careful. Always. He dashed downstairs to say goodbye to Zoe and his dad, then climbed into his truck and drove to his office, the pride puffing up his chest the minute he saw the Kent construction sign on the brick building. The building housing the office wasn't huge, but it was theirs. The real work was done on the job site. His oldest brother, Wyatt, was already at work studying blueprints. Morning, he said to his brother. If you say so. Rough night? He got a grunt in response, but since Wyatt had chosen the extra-large cup for his coffee this morning, Ethan assumed he'd been down at Stokey's bar the night before, no doubt continuing his quest to forget he'd ever been married. From the looks of his brother, that still wasn't going well. He'd always loved working with his brothers, even though sometimes they were a giant pain in the ass. But they'd rallied around him after Amanda died, just like they'd all rallied around Wyatt after his divorce. Not that Wyatt wanted any rallying. He just wanted to be left alone and had thrown himself into the business during the day and making a great attempt at partying his ass off at night, which Ethan supposed was a way to shut out the pain. Ethan hadn't had the luxury of that. He had Zoe to deal with. With no kids, Wyatt could handle his pain however he wanted. And he handled it with work, work, and more work. And then, play, play, and more play, which Ethan knew was just a smokescreen. Wyatt wasn't really having any fun. Frankly, Ethan thought it might be a good idea if Wyatt actually had a conversation with Cassandra. They'd divorced two years ago and gone their separate ways— she lived on the north side of the lake now, and as far as Ethan knew, they hadn't spoken a word to each other since the lawyers haggled out the settlement. 
Closure was a good thing, or so he'd heard. Ethan had even tried talking to Wyatt about it. Wyatt had told him where to stick that suggestion. Then again, now that Riley was back in town, Ethan finally realized that whole closure thing? Probably not a good idea after all. Where's Brody? Ethan asked. On a job site. Wyatt didn't bother lifting his head from the prince. That would require engaging someone in face-to-face -face conversation. Which one? Ethan took off his coat and pulled the permits he needed to take to a site today. The Mackenzie one. Foreman pitching a fit about a couple of the hands, so Brody went to unruffle some feathers. Okay, Tori coming in today? Any minute now. Ethan had just booted the system up. I need to look at the books. You got a death wish, man? You know how she gets if someone messes with the system? You want to be on the receiving end of one of her tirades? Good point. Ethan kicked the chair away from the laptop and went for the printout instead. The last thing he wanted was to get on Tori's bad side. She might be no more than twenty or whatever, but she had a head for numbers and a temper that made good on the old Irish and redhead adage. The only one who ever went toe-to-toe -to -toe with her was Brody, mainly because he liked to rile her up. Ethan and Wyatt tiptoed around her. Just as he got the paperwork out, Tori walked in, always a tornado in the making, both arms loaded down with bags, popping her gum, her wild red hair spilling down her back. Tori could have worked for the FBI. She could tell in a half a second when something on her desk had been disturbed. Her green eyes flashed in Ethan's direction. You touch my laptop? Do I look like I fear death? She snickered. How about you, Wyatt? Not on your life, sweet pea. Where's your idiot brother? Job site. Good. She cracked her knuckles and sat down at the desk. Never a dull moment at the office. Heard Riley's back in town, Tori said. Word spread fast around here. Ethan looked up to see Wyatt's distinct lack of interest as he buried his face in his work. Yeah. You see her yet? Zoe and I ran into her this morning. That got his brother's attention, and a frown. Don't even go there, Ethan. I'm not going anywhere with her, except to her concert. Wyatt rolled his eyes. Tori grinned and said, That's interesting. Not interesting at all. Zoe's a fan. Uh-huh. Really, that's it. Riley and me are in the past. Wyatt shook his head and Tori snickered. It was a good thing he had work to do out of the office today. It was past 10 p.m. when he finally got back from a job site in northern Arkansas, so he called his mom, who said Zoe could stay over. She often stayed at his parents anyway, whether she was in school or not, and since she was out for a holiday break, it worked out well for her to hang out with his mom and dad. He took the long way home, driving through Center Street with its quaint old storefronts and the town square, the kind of small town people saw in movies and thought wasn't real. It was real, and it was home to him. As he left the old town and pulled onto the main highway, he passed one of the hotels and saw Riley's tour bus parked at the new bed and breakfast. Kent Construction had refurbished the old Victorian for Bill and Macy Grant three years ago. A rambling, beautiful three-story, Bill and Macy had retired and bought the house with the intent of going into the hospitality business during their golden years. Guess that's where Riley and her entourage had decided to stay. Good for Bill and Macy. He hoped Riley was paying them a lot of money. She probably had plenty to spend. Not that he cared how much money she had or anything about Riley. He just hoped her visit was short so he could stop thinking about her at all. Chapter 3 Yesterday had been brutal. After interviews with the mayor, a few former teachers, and then one-on-ones with the biography host, where she asked Riley probing questions about her childhood, teen years, and hometown, Riley had had enough and needed a break. They'd dragged her all over town so they could get shots of her in front of all the major places in her life, from the playground to one of her foster parents' homes to the high school. Ugh, nightmarish. Joanne had had to kick her once when she rolled her eyes, but really... Maybe no one would be interested enough in her life so far to even watch, if she was lucky. She told them no interviews today. 
She told Joanne she needed some free time before the concert tonight, so she made up some flimsy excuse about heading into town to reconnect with her roots, to gain some fresh perspective so she could give some good interviews to the bio team. Joanne thought that was an awesome idea. Ha! <laughs> Fooled her. There were no roots to connect with, no people she'd stayed in touch with, and not a single person was interested in seeing her. Correction, they might be interested in hanging with her if there was a camera crew nearby, but no one would want to sit and talk to her. She had no friends here. She climbed into old worn jeans, her boots, and a warm coat, and put on a hat because, damn, it was cold outside. When she parked one of the rental cars on Central and got out, she peered up at the gray skies. Dismal clouds gathered and hung low, threatening bad weather later and obliterating whatever sun might have warmed the day. Wind was coming in from the north. Snow was coming. When was the last time she got to sit outside and judge the upcoming weather? When she was home in Nashville, she was secluded inside from the prying eyes of the paparazzi, so she habitually stayed indoors. She might go out back once in a while, early in the morning, but mostly when she got a chance to go home, she slept, exhausted from being on the road. So she missed a lot of mornings, and when she was done sleeping, she buried herself in her work at the studio. Despite the bitter cold today, it felt good to be outside, to be breathing actual air, to be able to lift her head and study the shifting clouds and think about coming storms. She remembered hanging out with Ethan and Amanda and her other friends, trying to guess when the first winter snow would hit. Soon, it looked like. Judging from the cheerful expressions of everyone out on the street, they seemed to be happy about it. Then again, maybe they were always happy. She had no idea. She no longer knew these people. She dragged the cap over her ears and slunk into her coat. She'd braided her hair today and worn no makeup. They'd expect Riley the star, not Riley the schlub. No one would notice her. Morning, Riley. Nice to see you out and about today. She stopped dead in her tracks and turned, her gaze following the heavy-set woman with short black hair who just greeted her. Who the hell was that? Morning, Miss Riley. Can I direct you somewhere? She pivoted and faced a tall, lanky man in his forties or early fifties. He looked familiar. Who was he? She tried to place him. He had a friendly smile. You probably don't remember me. I'm Trevor Troutman. My wife Karen and I lived next door to the Landows, one of your sets of foster parents. That's how she knew him. Oh, right. Nice to see you again, Mr. Troutman. You looking for some place in particular? No, sir. Just out for a walk. Good for you. Maybe gonna snow today, so enjoy the nice weather while we have it. Yes, sir. I'll do that. My Karen, she likes your music an awful lot. So do I, as a matter of fact. We'll be coming to your concert this evening. He looked up at the sky. Weather permitting, of course. If she was lucky, there'd be a blizzard and she could hide at the bed and breakfast tonight. Of course. Thank you. I'll see you tonight. So much for trying to hide out unnoticed. She should have known better. Trevor moved on, so Riley did too. Other than a new coat of paint or maybe a different awning, there hadn't been too many changes on Central. It was exactly the same as it had been when she'd left. She browsed the store windows, checking out the fashion that had changed at the clothing stores. Thank God for that. At least they kept up with some trends. She smiled at the red and white striped awning of Clusters Candy Store. Wow, it had been years since she'd thought about Clusters. Unable to resist going inside, she hoped to see the smiling face of Paul Hazelton working the counter, his thick mane of white hair perfectly quaffed under the red and white hat he always wore. Instead, a texting on her phone, gum popping teenager didn't even notice Riley had come in, despite the bell ringing over the door. Huh. Riley stepped up to the counter, her sweet tooth sparking to life at the colorful candies and chocolates beneath the glass counter. Gum popping continued. Buttons were being pushed, both behind and in front of the counter. Deciding what she wanted, Riley looked up at the girl who had a pile of strawberryish, purplish hair pulled up in a twist on top of her head. 
No cute red and white hat. Riley continued to wait, hoping she'd be noticed. She wasn't. Finally, she cleared her throat, and the girl sighed as if Riley was the worst inconvenience ever. Can I help you? Good God, Riley could see the color of the girl's gum. She wanted to tell her to close her mouth. When had Riley gotten old? Where's Mr. Hazelton? Who? Paul Hazelton? Oh, the old guy? Riley supposed bopping the girl in the nose would be uncalled for. Yes, the man who owns the store. He died two years ago. His wife sold the store to Ray Morrow, who happens to be my dad. She said in a snooty "I'm the owner's daughter" tone of voice. Paul Hazelton is dead. Riley's stomach pitched. Oh, poor Patty! What's she doing now? The girl gave a shrug. Last I heard, she's in Florida with one of her kids. So, do you want some candy? Riley forced back tears. Mr. Hazelton had always had a smile for her when she came into the store. He told jokes, bad, corny jokes, but he'd always made her laugh. The candy store had been one of her best memories of this town, and now this smart-ass teenager didn't give a damn about whether kids were happy when they left the store or not. So, do you want candy or not? She sniffled and nodded. Gave the girl her order and walked out, swiping tears out of her eyes as she made an abrupt turn and smacked right into an unmoving brick wall chest, dropping her bag of candy. Damn it! She squatted to the ground to pick up the scattered candy. You always were a sucker for gum drops and licorice. Her gaze shot up, and there was Ethan, warm eyes considering her. Wasn't this just perfect? She lifted her gaze to his. Paul Hazelton died. Some snotty teenager who doesn't give a damn works in there now, and I dropped my candy. Tears filled her eyes. She wasn't weak. She didn't cry. She scrambled to pick up the pieces, both literally and figuratively. Let me help. She shooed his hands away. I've got it. I'm just clumsy. He was smiling at her, his sexy, sensual smile that had always made her feel all gooey inside. The smile that probably made Amanda feel all gooey inside now. If he was even still with Amanda, she had no idea who Zoe's mother was. His little girl looked just like him: dark hair, whiskey-colored eyes, a dimple on the left side of the cheek. She'd noticed Zoe's dimple too. It was so cute. Riley, no, I'm fine. Sorry, I was distracted. I'll go inside and replace your candy. Don't. I don't need it anyway. He laughed at that and was already up and in the shop before she could object. She followed him inside. You back for more already? The girl asked. She's a candy fiend, Ethan said. Always was. Har har. Actually, she dropped her bag outside Tiff, so replaced whatever it was she had, and add two bricks of Rocky Road and a quarter pound of now and later's for me. Despite not wanting to be in here again, she couldn't help but smile at Ethan's selection. I see your candy choices haven't changed either. I need the energy for work. Yeah, what work is that? Wyatt Brody and I own the construction company now that Dad is retired. That must keep you busy. Very. She took the bag from Gum Chewing Girl. Ethan paid. I can pay for my own candy. He slanted her a look, and I can afford a couple bucks for it. They walked outside. Thank you. You're welcome. Ethan started walking, so Riley went with him. So you working in town today? Yeah, over there. He pointed across town where a steel frame could be seen. New performing arts center. Gotta have culture here. If you'd waited a year, you could be putting on your concert there. Oh, I guess I'll have to suck it up at the high school gym. He reached into the bag and pulled out a handful of candy. I imagine that's one hell of a step down for you. No way was she taking the bait. Time to turn the tables. Where's Zoe today? At my parents. Not home with her mother? No. Maybe Zoe's mother worked, and wasn't Ethan being evasive? She'd bet she knew why. 
Might as well find out and get it over with. So, did you end up marrying Amanda? He stilled, and Riley bit her cheek, wishing she'd kept her mouth shut. Why couldn't she have talked about the weather or something? Yeah, about that. Hey, none of my business. Sorry. I did marry Amanda. In answer to your next question, yes, she's Zoe's mother. Okay. Look, Ethan, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have. Amanda died four years ago. The sidewalk spun out from under her. She stopped, turned, and stared at him. What? Ethan dragged his fingers through his hair. Shit. Not the way I wanted to tell you this. I should have told you sooner, but didn't want to in front of Zoe. It's not something you blurt out when you first see someone after ten years. She hadn't heard anything he'd said. His earlier words still spinning around in her head. She died. Yes. Riley knew she was staring, but she had no idea what to say. Shock left her speechless. She'd had so many things she'd wanted to say to Ethan and Amanda, so many of them self-righteous, so many of them scathing and damning. She'd even had a speech all planned out, full of indignation and finger pointing. Everything she'd wanted to say ten years ago and couldn't because she'd run, and all her anger and hurt had just disappeared into the ether. Her chest tightened. She reached up and rubbed the aching spot on her breastbone. Had everyone she cared about died while she was gone? It suddenly seemed that way. Tears sprang fresh again, and she finally made eye contact with Ethan and saw the pain in his eyes. Oh God. Oh, Ethan, I'm sorry. I didn't know. There was kindness in his face, sympathy for her she knew she didn't deserve. I know you didn't. She had no idea what to say. Could only gawk at him as she stood rooted to the spot, frozen in time as she was propelled back ten years ago, before she found Ethan in bed with her best friend, back when Amanda and she were tight, were best buds, when they used to laugh with each other, share all their secrets. They'd been inseparable then, had vowed to never be apart. They were supposed to be best friends forever, and then one night had shattered all that, and she'd never spoken to Amanda again. Now she'd never be able to. Riley, pulling herself from the past, she looked around at the crowds, at the people who slowed down to stare, and finally dragged her gaze to Ethan. What must he think of her? He was the one who'd lost everything. He'd lost his wife, the woman he'd obviously loved. Zoe had lost her mother. What happened? You don't want to talk about this, do you? It's none of my business. I'm sorry. I should move on instead of asking questions you don't want to answer. Ethan knew the time would come when he'd have to tell Riley about Amanda. He just hadn't figured it would be right now. Then again, would there ever be a right time? Judging from her shocked and pale face, probably not. Come on, he took her arm and led her through the library and out the back door, waving at Barb, the head librarian, as they hurried past. On the other side of the street was the construction trailer. He opened the door for her and she stepped inside. Fortunately, they were alone. Have a seat. Want something to drink? No thanks. Really, you don't have to. It was leukemia. And it was bad. She didn't make it a year after the diagnosis. We tried everything: chemo, radiation, alternative treatments. But it was aggressive. There was nothing we could do. Riley stared up at him. That's too young. She was what, twenty-four or so? Yeah. I'm not in touch with people here. I didn't know. He shrugged and leaned against the desk. No reason for you to know. She inhaled and shuddered out a sigh. So many people I knew. My whole life was here, and I just walked away from it, from everyone. She lifted her gaze to his. It's not like I didn't care. I did. I know. And he did. He understood why. He was the reason. He and Amanda. I never hated you. I never hated her. He gave her a faint smile. 
Yes, you did. Her eyes filled with tears. She let them slide down her cheeks. He hated being the cause of her pain again. Damn it, Ethan. She's dead. I never wanted that. I was angry and hurt, but I never wished harm to Amanda. He pushed off the desk and came to her, kneeled in front of her. Don't cry. I know you didn't. Amanda dying isn't on you. It was a circumstance. She sniffed, shoved the heel of one hand under her chin. I'm just so sorry for you and for Zoe. It's a horrible thing. Zoe's resilient. She misses her mom, but she has me, her uncles, and my parents. What about Amanda's parents? Ethan shook his head. They took her death hard. Really hard. They withdrew and couldn't cope. Not even with Zoe. Her eyes widened. Good God! How could they miss connecting with Zoe? Ethan stood, shrugged. Don't ask me. I tried to reach out to them, but they wanted no part of me or Zoe after Amanda died. They left town a year later, said they couldn't handle the memories. Riley shook her head. That makes no sense, Ethan. Zoe was their connection to her. Don't ask me to explain them. I can't. I'm sorry for them, but not surprised. They were always so wrapped up in Amanda. She was their life. Losing her broke them. They were so angry, bitter, blamed me for it. How could they blame you for a disease? You didn't give her leukemia. I shouldered it because they needed to blame someone for the senseless loss of their little girl. How else do you explain why a 24-year-old healthy woman dies? Riley bent her head to her chest for a few minutes, and Ethan let her grieve. When she lifted her head, she wiped her eyes and straightened her shoulders. But the pain in her eyes? That shredded him. It brought back the loss as if it had just happened yesterday. If she hadn't left, she would have been here when Amanda died. That was on him. He had to bear some of the responsibility for that. It's good that you've been there for Zoe. She needs you. He relaxed, thought about Zoe. She's everything to me. I've made a lot of mistakes in my life. She's the only thing I've ever done right. Riley wanted to ask him what his mistakes were, but she saw the raw hurt in his eyes and the pride when he talked about his daughter. She wouldn't push any further, not after what he'd told her about Amanda. Amanda had been her best friend once. There'd been a lot of water under the bridge since she'd left, a lot of betrayal and hurt. But for a very long time, Amanda had been the closest thing to a sister Riley would ever have. If she'd stayed in touch with the town, with Amanda, if she'd learned forgiveness sooner, she'd have known. She could have been here for her best friend during the last year of her life. I'm sorry I wasn't here for her. You didn't need to be, but if it's any comfort to you, Amanda felt awful about what happened. She said if I ever saw you again, I was supposed to tell you that. Riley's eyes widened. I don't want to hear that. Ethan frowned. Why not? Because now I can't tell her that I'm sorry, too. I said some terrible things to her before I left. I hurt her. She'd hurt them both, but she couldn't make it right with Amanda now. She'd called Amanda a slut and Ethan a cheating bastard, and then left them both in the dust and never looked back. Ethan hooked his thumbs in his jeans, the action so familiar to her it caused an ache in her throat. From what I remember, she did the same to you. And now you tell me she said she was sorry. I'll never get the chance to tell her. You did. What? You did already, in your music. She listened to every song. She knew, Riley. She heard your apology. You know my music? What Zoe said yesterday? Yeah, I listen. I heard it all. The condemnation, the hurt, the raw agony of those first years. She'd always written her own music. Her first album had been her catharsis, pouring her heart out over losing Ethan to Amanda. It had been the grief of young love lost, about betrayal and anger. She'd sung about what it was like to open your eyes to what was around you so you'd never feel stupid again. 
The album had gone triple platinum, and she felt like she'd grown up and walked away from all of this, determined to never look back. But she had looked back, because later on she had written about forgiveness, about becoming wise and learning from your mistakes. She had written about people doing what they thought was right, and everything not revolving around you and what you wanted, and she'd sung about letting go. After time and distance, her anger had dissipated, and she had said she was sorry in her music, because she had bared her soul in her lyrics, and so much of her hurt had been directed at Ethan and Amanda. She'd made sure the whole world knew it. She'd gotten famous off her pain, but she'd finally realized that she had caused other people pain, too. Maybe no one else knew who she'd been writing about, but Deer Lake had known. I'm sorry, Ethan, for the lyrics, for the hurt I must have caused you and Amanda. Why are you sorry? You didn't do anything wrong. I did. Amanda did. I said it that night all those years ago, and I don't think I'll ever be able to say it enough. But you... You don't ever have to be sorry, Riley. You did what you knew how to do. You made music and you wrote your heart out. Don't apologize for that. She shuddered out a sigh. They'd needed to have this talk, but there was so much more she wanted to say and so many things that should probably be left unsaid. For so many years, she'd wanted to undo the past, but the past was etched in stone and there was no going back and changing it now. Yet no matter how many years went by, she'd always want to know why. Why he'd told her he loved her, then chose Amanda over her. She doubted she'd ever have the nerve to ask the question. The answer didn't matter anymore anyway. I should let you get back to work. She stood, grabbed her coat, and put it on. She reached for the door handle, then turned. You and Zoe coming to the concert tonight? He gave her a puzzled look. Yeah, you had your agent give us backstage passes, remember? Damn that, Susie? Oh, right, of course. Won't that be great? See you then. As she headed back toward her car, she felt empty inside, and everything hurt more now than it ever had before. Chapter 4 Zoe was on a high no sugar could match. Backstage in the gym, the sounds and lights and traffic of people buzzed past them as Riley's concert team readied the stage, transforming the gym into something unrecognizable, with lights and speakers and screens befitting Riley's status. Zoe bounced up and down on her light-up tennis shoes, unable to stand still as the roadies prepped for the event, and Ethan tried to keep his daughter from climbing right out of her hair. The concert wasn't going to start until nine o'clock, which was his daughter's bedtime. She hadn't napped today either, despite his mother's attempt to get her to rest. His kid was going to be toast by the time the concert was over, or she'd be on excitement overload and up all night. Ethan prayed for toast. Is it time yet, Daddy? Have you seen Riley Jensen yet? I haven't seen her. Can we go to her dressing room now? Zoe tugged on his hand for the millionth time. I'm sure Riley's busy getting ready for her concert. How about we just try to stay out of the way and be patient? Patient, a word not in a seven-year-old's vocabulary. But why can't we go see her? I bet she won't mind. She likes me. How about we wait until after the concert when she isn't so busy? But, Daddy, I want to see her now. Whining, sure sign of a tired kid. Ethan kneeled down and looked his beautiful daughter in the eyes. Zoe, we're not going to Riley's dressing room. The concert people were nice enough to give us backstage passes, which means you need to be on your best behavior. I know you're excited, but you still have to be good. And that means doing what I tell you to do, okay? Her bottom lip trembled. Man, was this kid good or what? He should get her an agent. He was usually a sucker for a quivering lip, but not tonight. He didn't want to be here. He'd already seen way more of Riley than he'd intended to during her visit, so his daughter was just going to have to suck it up. As soon as Zoe saw that her drama routine wasn't working, she lifted her shoulders practically to her earlobes, then dropped them, 
accompanied by a loud, dramatic sigh. Okay, Daddy, I'll be good. And now he had guilt. Of course, when didn't he have guilt? Fortunately, Riley came out of her dressing room, zeroed in on Zoe, and Zoe sure zeroed in on Riley. Riley Jensen, I've been waiting all night for you. Riley grinned and scooped Zoe up in her arms. You have? Why didn't you come to my dressing room? Zoe shot Ethan a scathing look. Daddy said we couldn't. Riley put her down, and Zoe slipped her hand in Riley's. Oh, well, you could have come in. I just relax a little before I go on. Believe me, if Zoe would have been in there with you, there would have been no relaxing. She laughed. It's no big deal. She looked down at Zoe. From now on, you're welcome to be wherever I am. See, Daddy, I told you she liked me. You'll be sorry you said that. You won't even be able to go to the bathroom alone. Riley arched a brow. She's a kid, Ethan. She's seven and demanding. Trust me on this. Riley looked down at Zoe. You ready for the concert? Yep. Susie came over. I have a spot all picked out for you two side stage with a great view. Why don't you come with me so Riley can get set up? Ethan took Zoe's hand. Let's go, Zoe. See you two later, Riley said, and moved off, a few people following after her. Susie set them in a chair at the side curtain where they had a perfect view of the stage. Ethan hoisted Zoe in his lap and waited while Riley set up with her band. She looked beautiful in tight jeans and cowboy boots, a flowing turquoise top, her hair spilling in soft waves over her shoulders and long earrings that sparkled in the light. She wore bangles on both wrists that shimmered in the overhead lights, too. She looked magical. She looked like a star. Hell, she was a star. The announcer came out, and the packed-to-capacity crowd went crazy. Ethan had never seen so many people in the high school gym. Once word had gotten out that Riley had come home, people from the surrounding cities came in droves. The gym was at capacity, given that it was a free concert. Ethan heard Riley's crew had set up a big screen and speakers outside for the overflow of people who couldn't get inside, especially since the fire marshal was keeping a close count on the number of people in the gym. After the announcer left, the crowd started clapping, their raucous cries and stomping feet commanding her to come out, demanding the curtains to part. But when the lights went out and the stage went black, a hush fell over the crowd. The curtains opened to a darkened stage, and the spotlight fell on Riley sitting on a stool with her guitar. Riley began to play, the song so familiar Ethan could hum it in his sleep. One of the songs from her first album, a song of loss and pain so deep, it brought a stab of pain to him as she sang the words that had torn him apart the first time he'd heard them. Turns out forever meant different things to us after all. Loving you was gonna hurt me after all. After it all, after it all, all the tears and all the pain, I still loved you after all. Her voice struck him deep in his heart. When she was younger, he'd loved to listen to her whenever she picked up her guitar. But then it had just been her and her guitar in his basement, or in his room, or his parents' living room, or wherever they were gathered with their friends. And later, when he'd bought her CD, he'd been struck by the sheer magic of how incredible she sounded. But the maturity of her voice and listening to her live was so much better than what he remembered from ten years ago, and light years from plugging in his iPod. This was the voice of an angel, and she sang only to him, about him, and even when she damned him for the sins he'd committed, it was pure heaven. Even Zoe was enraptured, her blue eyes wide, her normally chirpy voice silent as she leaned against his chest and stared at Riley as she went through the strains of song after song. Whether fast and upbeat and singing about cutting loose and dancing, or the slow and haunting strains as she sang of Love Gone Wrong, she wrapped her music around Ethan and his daughter, further reminding him of what he'd given up all those years ago. 
every note further sealed for him that he'd made the right choice in letting her go, in not trying harder to find her after she'd left. This is what Riley had been meant to do, and if he'd had to fall into Amanda's trap and lose Riley for this to happen for her, then it had been all worth it. The concert lasted an hour and a half, and when she ended on the soft melody of a country lullaby, his baby girl fell asleep in his arms. Not even the thunderous standing ovation the crowd gave Riley could wake Zoe. He sat there while Riley did an encore, not wanting to miss a moment of the last song she sang. When she came off the stage, she stopped, paused, and stared, and tears sparkled in her eyes as she stared down at Zoe. I don't think I've ever seen anything more beautiful, she said, her gaze meeting his. He was about to say the same thing to her about her music. Do you need to go home? Probably. Okay. He sensed her hesitation that she wanted to talk. What he really wanted to do was get the hell out of here. His head and his heart were filled with her and her music and the memories of the two of them. Big mistake to linger. He needed to shake the dust off the past and get his mind firmly in the present where Riley didn't exist. Stay. Please. Damn. Okay, I just need to lay Zoe down. She nodded. Bring her on back to my dressing room. Ethan lifted Zoe, followed Riley, and laid her down on the sofa in the makeshift dressing room they'd set up for her in the high school drama department's changing room. He covered Zoe with his jacket and took the bottle of water one of Riley's staffers offered him, then sat on the arm of the sofa while Riley shooed everyone who wanted to crowd in out of the room. She shut the door behind her and turned to him. That was a beautiful performance tonight. She grinned. <laughs> you think so? Thanks. I always loved your singing. Your voice is amazing. Her lashes tilted closed as she turned away. He couldn't believe she was unaccustomed to praise. She probably got it all the time. I'm glad you came tonight. Me too. Zoe loved it too. She fell asleep on the last song. Riley pulled up a chair next to the sofa. Late night for her. Long day for her. She was excited about this. I can't tell you how much I appreciate the invitation. She crooked a smile. For Zoe, of course. For both of us. I enjoyed the concert, too. It hovered on the tip of her tongue, the why-not-me question she wanted to ask. But Zoe lay sleeping like an angel on the sofa a foot away from Ethan. Now wasn't the time. It would never be the right time to ask a question for which there wasn't ever going to be a good enough answer. Because he'd preferred Amanda, and she'd never seen it coming. She'd spent years going over it in her head, all the times the three of them had been together. Why hadn't she seen it? Enough. She wasn't eighteen years old anymore. Amanda was dead, and there was no point in rehashing old hurts. But the question still burned inside of her, desperate to be asked. She hoped she could get out of this town and soon before the question spilled out. Great crowd tonight, he finally said, no doubt to fill the silence in the room. Yeah, it was. Who knew everyone would come? He tilted his head to the side. Riley, everyone here is proud of you. I didn't think anyone here liked me anymore. I hadn't been back since I left. People don't hold grudges like that. You know how this town is. I guess I forgot how forgiving folks could be. She'd forgotten a lot of things, like how to be forgiving. She lifted her gaze to Ethan, remembered the past, only this time the good parts instead of the bad. He looked good tonight in his dark jeans and long-sleeved dark blue button-down shirt, his muscles filling out every square inch. He used to be on the skinny side, but strong— Judging from the way he fit the shirt, she could only imagine the muscles now. He studied her, and she wondered what he saw. Country diva who couldn't be bothered to come home once she'd left. Ex-girlfriend who'd run and never returned. Bad friend who hadn't been here when her best friend had needed her most. What else must he think of her? Then again, she hadn't created this mess alone, had she? She hadn't been the one to climb into bed with Amanda and ruin what she and Ethan had. 
and again the question burned on the tip of her tongue, begging to be asked. Why? Ethan shifted, dragging the smoke of the past away and reminding her that she was a lousy hostess. Yeah, well, I should get Zoe home and into bed. Great job, Riley. Sure. He put on his coat and turned to her. Thank you again for the backstage passes. She wanted to tell him she hadn't even known about the passes, that it had been Susie's doing, but what point would that serve other than self-protection? You're welcome. Glad you came. How much longer are you staying in town? She cocked a brow. Anxious to get rid of me? His lips lifted. No, no, that wasn't it at all. I was just wondering if there was some place you needed to be with the holidays and all. She shoved her hands in the pockets of her jeans. No, I have to hang out here with a few of my people until this thing is over with. Thing? Biography thing. Oh, yeah, right. She shrugged. Not my idea. Honest. I'm a little young for a bio. The television people seem to think otherwise. He was delaying leaving. She wondered why. They said I've lived a lifetime in twenty-eight years, or some nonsense to that effect. Haven't you? You've gone through a lot to get where you are now. Was it her imagination, or was he drawing closer? Not really. I just got lucky. She found herself focusing on his lips, which was such a bad idea, because it got her thinking of how great a kisser he was, and how long it had been since she'd kissed him. And then she licked her lips, and his gaze traveled to her mouth and settled there. Luck had nothing to do with your success. Pure talent. She really wished he'd look somewhere other than her mouth, because now her throat went dry and she had to swallow, and lick her lips again. She suddenly wanted to kiss him more than she wanted to breathe. He took a step closer and reached for her. Daddy, I have to go potty. Riley took two steps back, and so did Ethan, both of them turning to focus on a very sleepy-eyed Zoe, who sat up and rubbed her eyes. Sure, Muffin. Where are we, Daddy? In Riley's dressing room. Zoe blinked, yawned, and grinned at Riley. Hi, Riley Jensen. You sing good. Riley laughed. Thanks, sweetie. He took Zoe's hand, and she slid off the sofa. We'd better go find a bathroom and then head home. I'll see you later. Okay. Bye, Zoe. Zoe waved. Bye, Riley Jensen. Only after Ethan closed the door to the dressing room did Riley sink onto the sofa and exhale. Ethan had almost kissed her. Even worse, Riley had really wanted him to. She had to get the hell out of this town and fast. Chapter Five. Have you seen the contract for the Lincoln Project? Tori asked him the next day. No. It's your project, Ethan. You were out yesterday having the contract signed. I don't know where it is. Maybe my truck. He kept his focus on the blueprint he was studying, trying to tune out anything else but work. Well, do you think you could go get it so I could enter it into the system? Later, I'm busy. He heard an audible sigh. Ethan, only Wyatt has the market cornered on brooding asshole. Hey, I am here. Wyatt grumbled from the corner of the office. So, Tory replied, it's not like your attitude is a big secret, and Brody is a close second in the annoying me until I want to scream department. I do my best, Brody said, having made an appearance this morning. Shut up, Brody. She turned her attention back to Ethan. Ethan, you're supposed to be the nice guy of the three brothers. If you turn cranky or irritating like these two, I might just have to start cracking some heads around here. He lifted his head and stared across the office at Tori. She tapped her pencil against the corner of her desk and gave him one of her trademark "Don't screw with me" looks. You wouldn't like her when she's angry, Brody teased. Shut up, Brody. Tori's jaw was clenched. It was clear she was reaching the boiling point. Sorry,、I、have a lot on my mind. Ethan fished his keys out of his pocket and tossed them to her. I'm pretty sure the contract is laying in the seat. 
She caught the keys and stood. Thanks. And what made you so bitchy today? Nothing. I don't know. Not much sleep last night. Oh, a date? She stopped at his desk and leaned against it, obviously eager for some good gossip. Too bad he had none for her. No. The place went silent. Good. Until he felt eyes on him. He lifted his gaze and Tori was still there, leaning over his desk to give him her X-ray vision, as if she could see into his brain. What? You know that's not good enough. And you're not my mother. And you know I'm going to continue to stare at you until you tell me where you were last night. Jesus, she was like a dog with a bone. Why? Because it obviously has something to do with your less than stellar mood today. No, it doesn't. Then you should have no problem telling us where you were last night. Shit. She's got you now, Ethan. Brody said, propping his feet up on his desk, and no doubt grateful he wasn't the one under Tori's microscope this morning. It was clear she wasn't going to give up. <sighs> I went to Riley's concert. Tori made a face and stood. Glutton for punishment, aren't you? Huh? But Tori was already out the door. Brody stood and came over to his desk, leaned against it, and folded his arms. What the hell possessed you to go to Riley's concert? Ethan was already nose down in blueprints again. Zoe likes her. Uh huh. And you sat in the back row and sucked it up? No, we had backstage passes. Oh, extra strength, pain, and humiliation. It wasn't bad. It's been ten years. She doesn't hold a grudge. Wyatt snorted. Bullshit. All women hold a grudge. Yeah, and you don't. His brother held a deep grudge against his ex-wife, and it was affecting everything about his life. Wyatt shrugged and took up his pencil again, effectively tuning them out. Brody, unfortunately, didn't. Seriously, man, what's up with you seeing Riley? I'm not seeing Riley. I took Zoe to her concert, then I came home. Now I'm at work, trying to work. He motioned his head toward the blueprints. But you can't deny there's some serious history between you two, and unfinished business. Brody's right. Tori came back in and shut the door to the office, laying the folder she'd retrieved on her desk. You should settle it, or you'll end up a grumpy old man like Wyatt. Again, I'm in the room. Wyatt grumbled. Oh, like you care what we say about you, Wyatt? Tori said as she took her seat and opened the folder. You ignore us all anyway, like you've been doing for the past two years. Go back to brooding. I'll pick on you another day. Wyatt had no comment. Maybe Ethan needed to try the silent approach in the future because arguing with them was getting him nowhere. There was no business to finish with Riley. So they want to interview Ethan. Riley's head shot up from the page where she'd been jotting down notes for a song and gaped at Joanne. No. Absolutely not. He's part of your past, Riley. A big part. You've written like twenty-five songs about him, and no one knows that but you and Susie and the band. And you're all sworn to secrecy. You promised. How had they found out about Ethan? The producers don't know about the connection between Ethan and the songs. They just know he was your teenage boyfriend, which makes him a part of your past. A part they feel should be explored. No, we talked about this. No, Ethan. She'd made it clear Amanda wouldn't be interviewed either, but of course that would never happen now. I don't want him or Zoe involved in this. Joe took a seat in the living room across from the roaring fire. The temperature had dropped and the skies were an ugly gray outside. Riley snuggled up in her sweats, Henley shirt, and thick socks in front of the fire. Intent on sipping hot cocoa and working on the song she'd started on the bus ride here, she'd spent part of the day lost in her music, happy to be alone and away from the production of the biography. When she wrote, she could shut out everything, including what had almost happened between her and Ethan last night. Except her songwriting had drifted into thoughts of first love and first kisses, and that's not at all where she'd intended to go. Instead, her idyllic moments of peace had been shattered by this. No way was she going to allow it. 
The thing is, Rye, Ethan has agreed to it. She laid her guitar to the side, letting it rest against the chair. What? They called him this afternoon, and he agreed to the interview tomorrow, as long as they promised to keep his daughter out of it, not mention her and make sure she stays off camera. Oh, no, that's not going to work at all. She stood. He absolutely cannot do the interview. Joe nodded. I'll get a staff member to contact the biographer and then Ethan. No, I don't want this staffed out. I need to talk to Ethan myself. She went into the kitchen and looked around. Surely there has to be a phone book around here somewhere. One of her staff members grabbed it from the counter and handed it to her. Thanks. She flipped through the book and found Ethan's name, dug in her purse for her cell, and dialed Ethan's home phone number. No answer. Damn. I'll try his parents. They might know how I can reach him. She dialed his parents' number, and his mother picked up. It had been years since she'd spoken to Mrs. Kent. A lump the size of her tour bus lodged in her throat. Mrs. Kent? Yes? It's Riley Jensen. She waited for silence, for condemnation, for something other than the enthusiastic response she got. Riley, honey, I'm so glad to hear from you. Why haven't you been by to see us yet? I'm so sorry we didn't make it to greet you when you arrived the other day, but Roger's knee is bad, and I knew Ethan would be dropping Zoe off. And look at me talking your ear off, and you haven't had a chance to say a word yet. Riley breathed a sigh of relief. It's so wonderful to hear your voice, Mrs. Kent. Please, call me Stacy. You're a big girl now. Thank you, Stacy. I was wondering if you knew where Ethan was. It's kind of important I talk to him. He's over here tonight. Everybody came over for dinner and game night. Why don't you swing by? I know everyone would love to see you. Oh, right. She just bet his brothers would love to see her. Oh, I don't know about that. If I could just talk to Ethan... Well, he's in the middle of a rather rousing game of Yahtzee at the moment, so you'd better come on over. Though I realize you're a big and important star and probably busy doing something, so I understand if you can't. It hadn't been said with malice. Stacy Kent thought Riley's dance card was full. Huh. I'm not big and important, and I'll be right over. Thank you for the invitation. Great, honey. See you soon. She hung up and wondered why she'd agreed to step foot into the lion's den. As she stood outside Ethan's parents' house and stared up at the brightly blinking Christmas lights lining the roof, as well as the smiling, waving mechanical Santa and snowman parked on the front lawn, Riley took a deep lungful of bitter cold air and wondered what she was doing here. She should have just asked Ethan's mother to have him call her when he was free. But it had been a long time since she'd seen his parents, and they'd always been so nice to her. Still, his brothers were here, and she'd just bet they weren't members of her fan club. Her knees knocked against each other, and her heart slammed against her chest as she rang the doorbell. One would think she'd never get nervous, but since she'd come back to Deer Lake, she'd had a ton of leg-shaking moments. Ethan's dad swung the door open. He'd changed a little in ten years— gotten a little grayer and a lot heavier, but his generous smile was still the same. Riley Jensen, aren't you just all grown up and more beautiful than ever? Come on in. Thank you, Mr. Kent. He shut the door behind her, then took her coat. Everyone's in the family room. He limped next to her. You have your choice of Yahtzee, Uno, or Scrabble. She remembered family game night, a required weekly event she'd always loved, and a tradition that obviously still continued. Family traditions. She'd never had them because she'd jumped around from family to family. That's why she'd loved the Kents. They'd been her stability, her normalcy, in a childhood that wasn't. The house hadn't changed much. As she surveyed the Christmas tree and the decorations she remembered so well— she was struck with a pang of homesickness she hadn't felt since the day she'd grabbed a bus out of town and hadn't looked back. The Kent home had been as much a home for her as it had been for Ethan. 
When she and Ethan had started dating her freshman year of high school, they'd been inseparable, which meant she'd spent much of her time at his house because she tended to bounce around here and there at foster homes. And even when she was stable, she didn't want to burden her foster family with yet another kid. The Kents had been like parents to her, kind, welcoming, treating her like their own daughter. She'd loved them. And like so many others in Deer Lake, she'd left them behind without explanation and without saying goodbye. She hadn't realized how much she'd missed them until she saw the stuffed Christmas moose on the table in the foyer, or the strings of lighted garland winding up the stairs, or the smiling snowmen who decorated Stacy's mantle. She heard the whistling of the train under the tree, remembering sitting in the living room and staring at that train for hours, marveling at the magic of a family holiday. All of these were part of her memories of Christmas's past. Not everything in the past hurt. She'd had good memories too. Fighting back tears, she put on a smile as Roger led her into the oversized family room. Guess who I found at the front door? Several pairs of eyes turned, and the raucous noise in the room quieted down. The guys all stood. The Kent brothers had certainly all grown up. Between Ethan, Wyatt, and Cody, the three of them were devastating in the looks department. All of them with thick, dark hair, tall and well muscled. Wyatt had dangerous good looks and a firm jaw. Brody looked like one of those sexy calendar models, all lean and lethal. But it was Ethan who caught her eye the most. It was in his eyes, the way he looked at her when she entered the room. Maybe because she'd been in love with him for half her life. Ethan came over to her. Riley, what are you doing here? I called your house, but you weren't there, so I called your mother. She asked me to come over. Stacy greeted her with a hug and held it for a minute. More like demanded she come join us. So wonderful to see you again, Riley. The hug was so warm and welcoming. Riley never wanted to let go. It's nice to see you again too. Now. What would you like to drink? Hot chocolate? Riley nodded. That would be great. Thanks. Good. I'll be right back. I'll go work your Scrabble words while you're gone. Roger said. Stacy shot him a glare. You even so much as peek anywhere near my side of the table, and I'll hobble your other leg. Roger narrowed his gaze. Your cutthroat woman. He turned and gave Riley a wink. She thinks I cheat. Ethan rolled his eyes. Duh, Dad, you do cheat. Roger lifted his chin. Do not. I just can't spell good, so your mother takes that advantage and uses it against me. Are we going to play here or what? Brody asked. I'm ahead of you and Wyatt, and I intend to kick your butts. I need to talk to Riley. We'll make it fast. And hi, Riley. Nice to see you around here again. Try to visit more than once every ten years, will you? Thanks, Brody. Nice to see you again too. And I'll try. And hi, Wyatt. Uh huh. Wyatt offered up a half-assed wave, then lifted a bottle of beer to his lips. Ethan led her out of the room and into the formal living room. They took seats on the sofa. Ignore Wyatt. He's got a major chip on his shoulder. It's not you. Trust me. He treats everyone with the exact same amount of disdain. Really? Why? It's his divorce a couple years ago. He's still carrying a grudge and isn't fond of women in general. Oh, ouch! I'm sorry. Ethan shrugged. That's his problem to deal with. Where's Zoe? Spending the night at a friend's house. Oh, I'm sorry I missed her. He smiled. She likes you too, and she had fun at the concert, even though she passed out at the end. Riley laughed. It's no problem. It was late. I'm glad she had a good time. She was stalling. She should tell him why she was here. Here's your hot chocolate. Stacy handed her a steaming mug, then hovered while Riley sipped. She moaned. It's just how I remembered. Thick with an overabundance of marshmallows. It's wonderful. Stacy beamed. I'm glad you like it. Ethan looked up at his mother. Uh, mom. Oh, 
Oh, of course. If you'll excuse me, I'd better go get back to Scrabble before Roger steals all my tiles. She left the room and Riley turned to Ethan. It's about the interview you're doing tomorrow. He frowned. The one with the biography people? Yes. Please don't do it. Why not? Did she have to spell it out? You know why not. I can't believe you even agreed to it. The history between us? What happened between you and Amanda? Do you really want all of that broadcast? He gave her the kind of indulgent smile he probably gave his daughter when she was overtired and acting out. Do you really think I'm going to give them details? How dumb do you think I am, Riley? All they want to talk about is us dating in high school. I figure I'll toss them a few crumbs and they'll be on their way. I'd like to keep that part of my life off limits. He laughed. Right. It wasn't off limits in your music, was it? Irritation skittered across her pulse, driving up her heartbeat. No one knew it was you. Wrong. Everyone knew it was me. Everyone who counted to me. Maybe none of the millions of your fans, but every single person in this town heard your lyrics and felt sorry for you and turned their eyes to Amanda and me. We couldn't walk down the street together for a long time when your first album came out. She stood and stared down at him. Is that why you agreed to the interview? You're looking for a little payback? He stood, too. What do you think I'm going to say to them, Riley? You were the victim in all of this. Nothing I say to them could paint you in a bad light. I did sleep with your best friend, and that's why you couldn't get out of Deer Lake fast enough. Hell, you'll come out of it looking even better, so I don't know why you're worried. You should be pushing me to talk to the media. Think of all the new songs you'll get out of this. A stab to her heart couldn't have hurt more than his words did. Is that what you think of me? After all we've been through, is that all you think of me? You believe that I'm back here to eke out some more heartache and song lyrics, Ethan? That I looked forward to reliving the nightmare of ten years ago so I could grab a few songs for my next album? After all, the well might be dry now, so maybe you and I could relive old times, or maybe even drum up something new and painful and I could go platinum again. It's all about using each other, isn't it? Because that's what you really think of me, isn't it? That it's all about the fame and the money. He didn't answer, which was, she supposed, his answer. She flicked her gaze to the doorway and there stood his mother, his father, and his brothers. Great. Did they all believe the same thing about her? The wall seemed to close in on her. She couldn't breathe. She had to get out of here. Now.